So hello everyone. Uh, I would like to talk today about continuous design systems, which is basically um, a case study or case studies of uh, Kivi.com and product board design systems. I'm, I'm Jan Tuman. I work at uh, product board as a design system lead, and I have uh, years of experience building design systems from previous companies, for example, Kiwi and Orbit. So what are continuous design systems? Continuous design systems, um, I think are a concept that uh, is not yet well settled. And I was curious what, uh, what uh, uh, people on Twitter think about it. So I asked like, you know, any other context, like what uh, is your understanding of, of this term? And I have got a, a few really nice, nice uh, responses. Um, and if I highlight some, some important parts of this, like I really like the one with supporting design as a continuous evolving practice and of uh, supporting uh, frequent change and, and evolution. Uh, there are a few more interesting uh, points like uh, continuous discovery or it, they are never done. There is um, one aspect that isn't mentioned explicitly here, but I think it's super important to mention it for the context of this talk. And it's a common scenario or at least a scenario where I, uh, that I experienced uh, in uh, several different companies before but there is already an existing product so uh, when we start a design system we are not starting uh, from uh, from a green field from scratch but we need to somehow tackle an existing existing uh, ui depth in our code base so when a design system is introduced um, it, its code base starts to grow also new features are uh, are start using design system but there is a lot of lot of code that is not it using a design system so uh, just to just to summarize um, the first four slides, like um, for me, continuous design systems uh, should support evolving product and evolving needs. They should understand users. They are never done because there is always so much work to do, and there is always the UI depth that we need to somehow tackle. And I also think that they should be observable and tracked, tracked because with, with, without that, it's uh, it's actually hard to to somehow create a strategy for uh, the existing code base. So the first challenge that uh, I would like to focus on is how might we create a design system that continuously support, supports evolving product. And uh, this is a time for uh, two case studies I would like to present to you. One is from Kiwi, where I have been working for about two and, and a half years on, uh, on design system, who is now about four years old, and then product board, where I'm working on design system now. So Kiwi, uh, we started with Orbit in 2017. And as I mentioned, there was already an existing product. Uh, Kiwi.com was founded in uh, 2000, 2012. And that means there was like five years of existing product and five years of existing code base. And to understand uh, the whole thing better, what we needed to do is that we started with initial discovery. We did. Uh, a few activities that, that should help us understand what already exists in the code base. So of course we did an UI components inventory, um, even like offline without Figma and Mirror or FigGen, we just like uh, took scissors and we, we cut it paper. It was, it was the fun times, right? We also did uh, CSS task analysis um, and identify all the different uh, colors, all the different font sizes across all the code base. And um, after component audit, we uh, actually prepared a workshop for prioritization of components. We just printed uh, a sheet uh, that was inspired by, by a work of, from Nathan Curtis, and, and we just organized a workshop with developers and, and designers picking the components they think that we should have in our design system. We also, or I also did internal interviews back in the days, asking about expectations from design system, uh, about what the design system should cover, what um, or how are people collaborating with developers during end of, end of phase? And I took notes from these. Um, sadly, I don't have a screenshot of, of these notes, but I also wrote an article that you can learn more about the process and uh, some most important findings that we, that, we, uh, that we found. After some time, like after um, analyzing all this feedback that we collected, we created a version one roadmap and, and these uh, two images are actually slides from internal presentation uh, where we actually pre where we presented this into into stakeholders and after a few months uh, a first version 
uh, of orbit was created or an orbit was getting more major, major with more components, with more guidelines. And also like a code base, code base grew because uh, new features were introduced. Uh, and some of these features are already, um, we're already using our design system. That's the, the dark pink, pink color. And after even more time, the, the whole code base grew as well. We were slowly refactoring some older parts. Adoption grew also components and content and, and design system grew as well. What also grew though was our uh, lists of list of tasks in Jira. Like we had like thousands of tasks in Jira. And um, as if you work with Jira, you know that it's it's a huge flat list. And we had a problem actually to realize like what are the most valuable things that we could focus on for our consumers and users. And uh, this is why we have research and this is why we have a discovery phase. Uh, so this is like a rough time timeline of, um, of some research that, that we've done in design system team, like the initial discovery, or we did, did some usability study for design system forms, or we were collecting regularly uh, satisfaction surveys um, re results from, from consumers. The blue part um, is like um, a list of uh, different product research, like use about the studies, feedback sessions with customers of Kiwi.com and so on. There was also um, a one layer of feedback that we were collecting. And it was from everyday conversations on Slack and design critiques and so on. But um, after, some, after some time, we realized that we uh, don't have a good way to manage all this feedback that is appearing over time. So what was happening to us was that we are basically forgetting all the, all the things, all the research that we, we collected and we were uh, prioritizing things only based on what we remember. And symptoms of this problem were quite obvious to us. We relied on our memory and project-based research. So we missed a continuity for some things. We spent time by discovering needs and solutions because we just forget them and we didn't uh, mark it down somewhere. And our backlog, as, as you could see, uh, was hard to manage sometimes working on like the sparse bit and, and things that, that people were like loud about. And um, this is all related to one, one uh, known bias, which is called recency bias. And recency bias occurs when people tend to emphasize very recent events or, or observations instead of looking at events over time. So for us, it was all these notes from initial interviews that actually I lost, I, I, didn't, I couldn't find them even on my Dropbox anymore. And all these smaller or larger UI audit foundings, everything was forgotten for us and we, we, we didn't go back to this. And what we realized that we need to shift from a project mindset like we did to a continuous mindset. And, and this is a time for, for a case study number two for a nucleus, which is our design system at Product Board. I will uh, be talking how we apply continuous mindset to Product Board design system. I'm not saying like we have the, the best solution ever, but it is somehow working for us. I will, I will show you a few examples of that. I will also show you how we dog food our product because Product Board uh, is actually a tool that, can, that is helping us to manage the whole thing. So, to give you more context about our product, Product Board is a product management platform. It helps teams and people uh, and product managers uh, understand what customers need. It helps to prioritize things and create roadmaps. It has a few key features that are related to this talk, and one is a feedback repository. It is also a backlog of ideas and features. It allows us to connect feedback and ideas in backlog, and then we can prioritize and build those roadmaps from these things. So let's uh, let's check the, the timeline again. Like in 2020, we started with uh, our design system with Nucleus. We also had some 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 past baggage in our code base because Product Board was founded in, in 2014. So we had a six years of existing product already, uh, and of course all the front end code base and design design uh, designs attached. So again, we started with initial discovery. And one of the first things that we that we discovered is that we have a lot of UI shared folders across the whole code base, and I will talk about uh, uh, tackling this, this a bit a bit later. We of course also did UI components inventory, 
now we use Sigma for that. Um, we also took very detailed notes about like what are the emerging patterns across all these all these components, smaller or, or, or larger. I also did like interviews with product teams and stakeholders asking about their expectations from the system, about the current state, about uh, how they think contribution models should work or uh, where the whole thing can fail because these were like very interesting findings for me. And then when I had all these notes from our initial research, I did one thing. And this, this is a big common pattern here across the, the next about 15 minutes. I just took all this feedback and I saved it into our feedback repository. Uh, which which happens to be product board. Um, we also like collected and analyzed all the other content that we already have in product board for our product, and we moved all these ideas and all the possible improvements to our design system backlog, um, which has a huge benefit because now with feedback in a, in a, in a, in a like stored in product board and, and backlog of ideas stored in the same place, we had a single system of record for our design system and. What product board allows us to do is that when we have, for example, a note with insights like this, we can actually highlight pieces of this and we can connect them or create ideas from them in our backlog. Then later, when uh, more feedback appears, we can again do the same thing and we can actually link uh, this feedback to the, for example, to the previous, previous idea. Uh, so now it has four insights and then we, we can track it like this. Um, I'm also a huge fan, fan, a fan of um, continuous discovery framework. And uh, this quote is from, from Gerard Shiva. And it's about uh, needing a week, weekly interactions with customers because we are making product decisions every day. And when we ask a question like, what would be some important interactions with consumers of our design system? The, quest, the answer was quite clear. Like uh, we have uh, hundreds of conversations on Slack. We have thousands of comments in Figma. Uh, we have uh, PRs and comments and PRs and code reviews on GitHub. Um, so how could we track uh, all these conversations so they won't get lost in the past? This is, this is something that I mentioned with Orbit. We were, we, are, we were not tracking these conversations and we were mostly relying on, oh, someone actually mentioned that already. So uh, the solution here is quite obvious and that we took all this feedback or we took all these comments and stuff like this and we, we are saving them into feedback repository. I, will, I want to show you how it works in practice because I think it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting thing. How does, so how does our everyday continuous discovery process look like? For example, we have Slack and uh, usually on Slack, there are requests from the community, from internal community, and we also provide us our support there. Here is a message in an engineering design system channel from one of the developers. What we did, because uh, Product Board has a Slack native Slack integration, that we took this, um, this message and the whole thread and we saved it as a note to our feedback repository. And then we just highlighted things that were interesting somehow for us and we created six new ideas uh, that we now track in our backlog of ideas and uh, i mentioned product board um, a lot because we use product board for this but i want to emphasize that the process here is important not the tool itself with figma it's um, a bit more complex because there is no native integration for for product board so we needed to figure out or i, I needed to figure out how to put interesting conversations that are somehow related to UI, UX patterns or confusion about design system to our, our uh, feedback repository. So what I, I was doing for some time was uh, copy pasting things and this is, isn't effective. So I was like thinking there has to be a better way for this. And uh, luckily Figma has a REST API that can work with comments. So I created a small, small script that actually analyzes all the comments in Figma and searches for hashtag PB, which is the hashtag that we, we chose. So if anyone in hashtag, um, in comment, sorry, uh, mentioned hashtag PB, um, the bot recognized that, it takes the whole conversation and automatically create uh, a note with this content in our feedback repository. Then of course we can do the usual thing. We can process this feedback, we can connect this feedback to ideas. Uh, the problem is that we have thousands of comments uh, in our Figma file across uh, hundreds of files. 
And I was thinking like, how can I easily discover important insights across so many thoughts and comments? Because until now I was just relying on, on uh, me noticing that there is some interesting insight or people mentioning me um, their comments. So what I did is that I actually leveraged, leveraged Comments API even more, and I created a small tool that I call FixPot, which does one thing only, basically. It creates a long stream, long feed, imagine like Twitter feed, but for Figma comments. And it takes all these projects, all these files, all the comments, and it just like uh, displays them as threads in the, in the feed. And then I can even like click a button in this feed and, and push the whole note or conversation from Figma to our feedback repository. With GitHub, it's a, it's a similar thing with, uh, as with, um, as with uh, Figma. There are interesting discussions, interesting points inside of PRs, code reviews. And what I'm, I'm doing or we are doing right now is that we are just copy pasting these things as notes to our feedback repository. But we are only discussing if there is a way how we can automate this via, via GitHub Actions. Uh, there is one other important, important source of feedback that, that we uh, continuously work with. And several design critiques uh, per week. Uh, we hold office hours for our design system. I have many, many one-on-ones with designers, with, with, with uh, copywriters. And there is no like miraculous solution for this. But I'm just doing that. I'm just like very diligent in taking notes. Uh, and I'm just taking screenshots if a new pattern appears or a new need appears. Uh, and not just me, but also like other designers are, are taking these uh, screenshots because they know that, that we are tracking feedback from these things and they know that if it appears in our feedback repository, we will process it and it, it can get uh, some attention in the future. And then of course we save these feedback to our feedback repository, uh, which we can then process to ideas in our design system backlog. And after some time working like this with all the insights from all the different sources and all the ideas that are connected from that, we will arrive to something like this. We have a list of a long list of possible ideas, possible improvements, but we now have also all the insights, all the research linked to them. And we can open basically any, any feature or any idea and we can see what we were like, uh, what we are like, what we are tracking there for information. We can use this, for example, when we will, when, when this uh, feature or idea will become a priority and we want to work with that. And what I was talking about mostly until now was like um, mostly internal feedback from customers, uh, not customers, consumers of our design system. But there is one more very critical source of insights and feedback, and it's from end users of our product. And over the past seven years, we collected about 60,000 of pieces of feedback for product board as a tool. And when I was like uh, going through this feedback, I said like a five way person persons from this feedback is somehow related to design system it can be something about accessibility it can be requesting different themes for the for the product it can be it can be uh, confusion about some key patterns and i realized that this is a huge opportunity for us to actually use this feedback for prioritizing things that we will work on and or document in our design system so uh, what we are doing is that we are tracking this, the feedback for our design system in the same feedback repository as we track the feedback for our product. Of course, it's a product board for us. Um, and if you are not tracking like uh, feedback even for your product, it can be a quite nice opportunity for your design system to become a champion for this organizational change because what you can see, like if you track the feedback and we track internal uh, feedback from internal consumers, the blue one and the red one, which is a product, product feedback, there is a lot of insights and we can create a lot lots of in ideas from that and we can then work with that. But this is a lot of work, it, it is. It's like a continuous day-to-day -day work. Is it worth it? What's the impact? I shown you this, this uh, graph uh, of our previous research and this still happens, like we are still forgetting things, but Instead of, of having this list of uh, ideas and backlog in Jira without any feedback connected to that, we now have this list of, of features or ideas with all the insights connected to them. 
And this is super uh, useful for us because we can then, for example, sort all these features or ideas by insights count and, and uh, by things that people connected or we connected to this over time. And we can easily spot some opportunities because for example, this uh, is saying us that we have a lot of feedback or accessibility in our product. So this can be also the huge, uh, like uh, this can be also very useful for us to sell that we should be focusing on accessibility and sell it to our stakeholders because we have very specific feedback from our customers. And what's even more important, we have it somehow quantified. Design systems are about internal requests as well, or as well, mostly because we need to support internal consumers. So we can also filter, for example, on internal feedback, and we can see that there are like um, already some ideas or features that we could work on. And we can go one by one when do our discovery or planning, and we can just see, okay, so these are the things that we connected. In this specific case, it's uh, every request for a custom icon that was um, that was requested on Slack by developers, by designers, or written down by me is now connected to automating the delivery of new icons. So eventually, eventually it can happen that we will focus on this because there will be enough value for us to do. It also helps us to more easily observe our long-term backlog and work with our own long-term backlog because we can group things into buckets, into categories. And uh, then because of feedback, we can see that something is getting some attention or there is, for example, a few, few ideas already linked. So we can then uh, prioritize this. We can even introduce this as a sprint goal and maybe work uh, with focus on a new tooltip. Um, a great thing about keeping everything and tracking everything is that when, for example, a new writer joins or we will, we will prioritize a specific word, for example, in Sprint for documentation, we can go through all the collected feedback and we can just search for docu documentation ideas and we can we can um, use these uh, notes that we link there over time as, as a source for documentation. And my favorite part of our backlog are UX patterns. UX patterns <clears throat> are mostly like a small buckets or sometimes even large buckets of things that could be documented in our design system. And there is so many of them, but we are not always sure which are which UX patterns are more important to document. And with this data, with these insights connected to them mostly from our customers and to the product, we can easily spot uh, top candidates for uh, a documentation, audit, or anal anal analysis. What I also do, and it, this is my personal hack, and I'm not sure that this is a correct way to use uh, Brackboard, but what I also do is that I just highlight uh, interesting parts in, uh, in different articles, and I push them into, into our feedback repository as well. And then when we are working on, on documentation, for example, for undo pattern, like in this case, uh, we can use this as an inspiration for how the content could be structured, what, what should be mentioned in this, doc this pattern documentation, and so on. So what, what are benefits of, of continuous feedback processing like this? Like the biggest one is I think that we are not losing even the smallest insights. Also our long-term backlog is more manageable because it's well-structured, it has feedback connected to that so we can, we can prioritize over that, uh, like with help of that. Uh, we are also creating a central knowledge, knowledge base. So not everything lives in heads of the first people who start the design system, but we are somehow like, uh, moving this into a public or available space for every every team member. And of course, I mentioned this is a very easier prioritization. But let's address this like uh, elephant in the room. Uh, can this process be done without product board as a tool? Yes, yes, it can for sure. Like um, here, the, what is important is process, not the tool itself. And there are, there are like other tools, even like free ones like Notion, Airtable or Google Sheets that can be somehow adjusted or hacked for the process. Or there are like many other product management softwares that could be used. So let me go first to the, uh, back to the challenge uh, number one, how might we create a design system that continuously supports evolving product? Uh, there are a few key, uh, key takeaways from, from my talk. There is, um, 
a recommendation, or I would recommend to track every conversation, especially in the tool that are used by systems consumers every day. Um, I would try to keep an eye on the research done by product teams because there are, there are many insights helpful for the design system as well, and especially on roadmaps of other product teams because it helps to, to plan for the upcoming quarters uh, easily. I would try to find a way how to connect insights with your backlog. Uh, this, this is a key thing and, and the longer you do this, the longer you are connecting insights with, with ideas, the more benefits it has over time. And I need to say that I, I kind of got addicted to continuous discovery process like this. And I couldn't actually probably work without it anymore. There is one more thing that I mentioned um, in the start of my presentation. If you remember, we learned about UI share folders in our code base. So when we were starting with Nucleus with our design system, we actually decided to move all this content, uh, all these components from UI share and we decided to use it as a baseline for our design system, which possibly, or not possibly, which just introduced some UI depth into our design system from start. So we started to do continuous work on improving the quality of components to match, match what we consider as the high quality components. I will talk about this. And there is a second challenge with this, which is also the continuous work, of course, is how might we get a good observability for the maturity and adoption of our design system. And just to be aware of time, I will have like a few more slides, it will be rapid fire, and I will be happy to talk about this in the future. So what we do for each of our components in our design system, we track health criteria. We define 10 different criteria that, we, that are helping us to, to uh, understand, not just us, but everyone to understand what we consider as a high quality component. And this was actually inspired by Sprout Seeds and Adobe Spectrum. They have also some checklists and, and some health criteria. Then we have a badge or health status for each component visible in, uh, in Storybook. Um, we even surface now, like from last week, actually, we surface this health status to our Storybook header. So every time someone opens the component in Storybook, they can see uh, the quality level or health level of the component so they know what they can expect if the component is matched with uh, Figma or if there will be some issues or if they shouldn't use the component at all. And then we use this uh, this data for actually communicating the close maturity uh, to our uh, to other product teams, to our stakeholders, uh, because this helps us to somehow visualize like uh, what is the status and the maturity of components in our design system. Um, as I mentioned, we, we moved a lot of a lot of components, existing components to our to our design system. Uh, and it it uh, brought a good benefit to us. Like uh, the thing that they were already used in product uh, increased our adoption uh, from, from day one. We just needed to be sure that we are aware what, what that means. So we, we are tracking usage in our code base for each component living in the design system. We use a RAC scanner for that. We use Looker for visualization of this data. And it also actually helps us to see the, the other side of the spectrum. For example, components that have one, two, maybe three usages. Uh, so maybe they shouldn't live in the design system at all. But now we have some strategy how to work with that. Uh, what about adoption? Like I mentioned that because we uh, adopted or we moved some old UI components to our design system, uh, we got some adoption uh, from, from like uh, like for free basically, but there is also a lot of lot of uh, product that is not using these old components, and this is something we consider as UI depth. What does it mean in the practice? We did some experiments with uh, visual measuring of our adoption, um, and we can clearly see that even that we would like change something in the design system, it wouldn't propagate to all the areas in the product because not everything is using the design system yet. There is still a huge area that needs to be uh, improved. Um, we also track uh, like more specific parts of our design system, especially typography and icon adoption. I don't want I don't want to go deeper into this. Uh, the baseline to know is that we have we currently have two icon sets. One is deprecated, one is not, um, and we are tracking like how many 
of icons is used across our core base. There is an uh, excellent article from my colleague, Philip, uh, who wrote a process, how we approach this. So if you are interested in tracking adoption of design system, there may be some interesting uh, tips for you. So what are some key takeaways about adoption strategy? Um, I believe that it's good to be patient. Design systems are not for a quarter, they are not project for a year, they are for a long term. Like we need to figure out how we can continuously work, not just with improvements of the system, but also, also with existing uh, UI depth and code base. And for that, it's important to identify what's UI depth for you, for your use case. And for now, well, for us currently, it's uh, typography icons um, and so on, and track this. And also surfacing adoption metrics to stakeholders helps because then it becomes tangible to them. They can clearly see, oh, okay, so this is how it looks with all of the system and they can see like uh, all the green areas and areas that are not green on the screenshots. So it's easier for them to understand like how big part of the product is using the system or they can see, oh, we are using a lot of the propagated components which uh, are not in the design system. We should somehow uh, plan how we will refactor them. And that will be it uh, from, from me today. Uh, I hope it was somehow useful and maybe uh, with some pieces that you could you could use for your design system. And yeah, I'm on Twitter. So if you have questions, if you have ideas, if you want to share how you do things in your company, uh, please do. And uh, let's continue our discussion uh, online. Thank you very much. This is awesome. Right, so let me first grab the screen from you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Honza. This has been lovely. You're welcome. Thank so, um, yes, we do have a lot of questions, a lot of celebration in the mirror board. And um, the questions that were showing up here in the Zoom chat, I was uh, trying to get them inside the mirror board just to keep it uh, easy for me to read them out. And well, first, I would like to apologize uh, the people watching. As you noticed, uh, the camera went off uh, a little bit. Uh, we are trying to figure out some of these technical details. But indeed, uh, trying to use a very good camera that cannot take up the heat uh, results in this kind of thing. But hopefully, for the rest of our Q&A until the break, everything will work just fine. So uh, let me actually uh, start my video. And this. then we have a good discussion. Um, well, and I uh, see already we have some panelists. Um, Pierre, do you mind uh, just uh, turning off your camera, um, Pierre and Carolina, until our next session? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So uh, let's see. We are now in the board, and I do see some people used uh, uh, the thumbs up for voting. So I'm just going to target those first, and then um, we, if we have time, we'll cover the rest. So um, one very important question: Can we get access to the presentation slides somehow? Uh, of course, I will. I will share it after my talk, and I will. I will put a link to to a mirror board. Awesome. I mean, like kudos to the design of it and the whole thing. Also, uh, it has improved so much from the past conference. On that, you are now much more calmer and uh, yeah, speaking a very good pace. Congratulations. Really awesome. I was afraid of that. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's <laughs> going you. a really nice Thank pace. Uh, it is a lot of content, and uh, that's why some people want to just uh, take their time to uh, watch the slides uh, by themselves as well. Cool, so a very interesting question. How can we manage the older and the newer version of the components without losing track? That's that's a challenge. Um, uh, we just deprecate the thing. Like, uh, as I, as I mentioned, maybe let me start differently. As I mentioned, like we moved all the co old co components or the components that we consider as reusable enough to our design system, which also means that if we start to, for example, unify their API to match um, our naming conventions, we are introducing breaking changes to the, to the code base. That's, that's a definitely a challenge. And what we do with, um, like, with this, all this tracking, all this like uh, data, we know, for example, that uh, a component, like uh, old, we call it legacy, we stop with that. I don't want to go deeper into that, but with all the, all the, but all the, for example, the button, 
I mean, it has like 100 uh, use cases, even in the all, all components, right? And we knew that uh, we just can't change it. So we did a discovery, we did a technical discovery as part of the process, and we identify what are the current, current um, what is the current API, what, uh, how many times it's used and, and when. We also identified uh, how are people overriding the component because like there wasn't any strict API. So, so we need to understand how are people overriding component because we need to understand what should our new button support as well. And then we decide if we want to refactor the button or if we want to improve its health. And this is like per component basis, uh, depending on how many times it's used. They may be like, um, for example, with tooltips, we deprecated the old one. And I think we shouldn't. We should just uh, iterate on the old one because we have, now we have like 150 deprecated tooltips all over code base and we don't have a good strategy what to do with that. And we need to somehow tackle this. But uh, for example, with uh, drop downs, and we knew that there was just like I don't know two hundred different different drop downs in uh, like use cases of drop downs across the app that we just uh, learn from the total experience and we'd say okay so let's do small improvements even like I don't know introducing like uh, a focus into drop down or auto -pos auto positioning or better better like mechanism for positioning some internal changes in the API may bring a benefit and uh, the good thing is it's already adopted so we can use it with that. You can work with that. Does, yeah. Did I somehow answer? <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess the, the very simple answer is it's difficult, but uh, and <laughs> I, didn't, I actually didn't answer. There was the question about the old and new. Yeah. When we actually decide to deprecate the, the old thing, we uh, usually rename it and we also scan for all the imports in the code base and we just rename it there as well. Mm. Deprecate as deprecated. We move it into the deprecated section in our storybook. We uh, add a health status that is deprecated and and let me switch my camera. <laughs> um, no problem. So I, I do have the next question while the, mm -hmm. the camera is uh, being set up again. So how do you deal with um, the noise of the feedback that becomes outdated slash irrelevant over time? Uh, this is this is covered uh, on discovery discovery phase. Like when we when we see that uh, there is a lot of feedback and that we should probably tackle it, we just do a discovery of what is the, what this feedback is and how it's relevant. We can disconnect the feedback. We can we can, we can move the feedback to a diff different different idea because we may we may know more by then, and it, it's just a discovery discovery phase for each, everything we do. Cool. But but this is this is a, this is a great point. Like this this may happen for sure, uh, but also like what. Uh, what happened to us at Kiwi that uh, we knew that our, our design language is not evolving that fast. Mm. So, because uh, a lot of this feedback, and we probably it's similar, like uh, we have like three years, about three years of our current design language. So all the feedback collected in past three years uh, can be uh, relevant for our existing UI still. And we can also, also of course, filter uh, for feedback just from last 10, 9, 90 days or feedback from last uh, two, two years, which will help us to uh, somehow get rid of the old things that may not be related anymore. Yeah, yeah. And how are you tracking the code debt versus the design system usage that you showed in the graph? Um, we don't have this solved. Like we track uh, on a pieces of debt, we track typography and we, we track icon because that's, we know what 100% is in that case. So for icons, it's easy. We have two icon sets. One is deprecated, one is not. And we know about the, the usage, how many times is which icon used. With typography, we are thinking how to, how to solve this. And we came up to a solution where we uh, introduced a linter, um, like warning linter in code base that just uh, pings um, users uh, where they use font size, line height, or font byte directly without using design system component. Mm -hmm. Then uh, in our pipeline, we are collecting these warnings and we are pushing them into our uh, Looker, look, look, Looker dashboard. And of course, like a uh, number of font sizes is uh, like direct definition of font sizes is, is for us the, the depth and number of use cases of text, text heading and, and these typography components is the preferred way. So we can create like 100% and then you can create a graph for that. Okay, very cool. And did people, by people that they mean designers, developers, etc., have to be made aware of the need to really give feedback, or was a certain 
feedback culture already in place. Hmm. I think uh, we have pretty strong feedback culture already. Um, also, like uh, when it comes to Figma, for example, there is like a lot of comments, a lot of discussions there. People are using Figma even for for note note taking sometimes during uh, during design critiques, right? So those are interesting insights as well. Um, and with Fixpot, it helps me to somehow just quickly scroll through that scan from for the content, maybe even search for specific phrases and identify uh, and discover some pieces that could be interesting to track. Um, but like not every everyone is, is giving this uh, feedback. Like there are, for example, designers who are putting their feedback directly to product board as notes. Uh, there are designers who prefer to uh, get in contact with me directly on one-on-one -on -one basis. So I'm taking the notes then and the developers is, is the same. Uh, there are also discussions in DMs. There are discussions in, we are trying to put these discussions into public channels, but it's an like, I guess, continuous process. Uh, Makes sense. And uh, let's see, is there uh, or the bot for the API request available somewhere to sneak peek? Uh, which which bot, sorry? The API requests. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I actually, last week I, I released a small tool uh, called fixpot.io. So uh, it's open for early access and, and it's basically the convert, converted bot into the feed. So so if, if you are interested in that, just uh, go to the, the fixpot.io uh right why you think it could help you and uh, i will be opening it to to people uh, soon to other things yeah silvia so just shared a link here on the yeah. zoom yeah. chat but also uh we will share it uh, in the mirror board and in slack as well cool and how do you uh, feedback slash comment back to the user who suggested all that feedback so they know that you tackle their suggestion slash request mm -hmm. There are a few ways, like with Slackbot it's easy because like Blackboard has a native Slack, Slack uh, bot, uh, which is uh, used also by our customers. So we use it for internal purposes as well. And when I push something to Blackboard to our feedback repository, it just uh, writes them back into thread a message, it replies, hey, this project is being processed. So they know that something is happening with that. Um, when it's in Figma, it can be either that I use the hashtag PB, which uh, designers already know what is what, what's it for. And I also like when I was starting with this, I was also writing, hey, I'm pushing this to product board. I was actively telling them I am tracking this feedback. This is important feedback for us. And we will somehow uh, manage that. A good thing with tracking that is that, um, yeah, and we don't have a good way for GitHub yet. Yet we will, we will get there eventually. But the good thing is that when we, um, we will have time or we will make a priority to focus on some idea that we call it a feedback for, we can see who reported, who requested these features, and we can we can then then go back to these person to these people, for example, for early testing or or, or private testing and uh, of components and so on. Nice. And how do you version the system? Like track the changes in the DS library in code, announce release, and manage people to call changes. We don't use Semver uh, because uh, our design system lives in uh, in a, a monorepo, so everyone has access for that. Uh, it was super helpful for us, like regarding contributions, because it was easier to contribute and so on. Um, but we do a weekly change log. Uh, every Friday we release a message into a Slack. We have a weekly change log on Notion, and when a new things uh, ha uh, happens, uh, we we just like at all the items that happened in past week into change log. Uh, we, or usually I will write a change log message with the biggest highlights. I'll create maybe some image uh, that is showing the highlights of new components because people like to consume also images, and we just post it into into one specific channel for releases of uh, design system to Slack. And um, I follow up to that then because I'm curious uh, myself. Uh, is there any traction to those announcements? Like, do people enjoy reading them, or is it really just the design system team? Like, ah, oh, we're excited, and everybody's like, yeah, whatever. Both, I guess, depends on the content. Um, like when we when we were at Kiwi, we are like um, somehow vaguely tracking like all the emojis on the on the on Slack. Um, they make me happy also in product board because I just see, oh, so people at least read it. Um, 
sometimes I, I get answer asking about exact same thing that I just wrote to, to the change log uh, because people just scan it quickly. And I think that that's the common, common scenario. They just like scan it, see if there is something. But what we are doing that we are uh, reaching out to people who requested things um, because it works the best on one base. The change log is mostly for history, historian and, and, and I don't know, keeping it visible that something is happening. And uh, there are few people who are interested in that, usually closer to the design system, uh, but it's also for us because we know what happened in the past. Yeah. And in that uh, sense is also the next question, uh, very interesting. Um, are you tracking these decisions that you made and why you made them? So the reasons why you made the changes to a component, just to be able to remind yourself and the reason in case somebody asks to change it back in the future. Uh, we are trying, we are not that successful with it all, all the time. Um, when we are, for example, introducing a new component, we have a RFC process, a request for comments process. So it's a, it's a part of discovery, part of, of uh, definition of done. And um, what we do is that we, a designer and developer, uh, connect and they go through the API in Figma, go through the API in, in code, and they, they just connect it so it works together. There is a document, a notion that everyone has an access access to because like we have the open RFC library for the, everyone in the company. We even have a bot, a uh, bot in, uh, in on Slack who is uh, uh, watching this, watching this, uh, this RFC library and pushes, hey, there is a new RFC, so everyone can actually uh, spot it if, if they are uh, in the channel. Uh, the idea was that when there is a change in API, we should go back to RFC of the component and uh, write it there. It doesn't happen every time. We are not that, that successful with that. Um, what I'm also trying to do for design decisions is that when I'm taking notes uh, from design critiques one on ones, I'm trying to be like very, like I try to explain it to, to my future me basically. Like uh, I don't want to keep anything to my imagination like oh what did i mean by this i'm trying to be like very descriptive and say okay so we are doing this and this is a proposal for this change because because uh, i don't know like uh, there was this problem in this scenario and because it's all tracked in the in the feature we have access access to that later we don't have it yet in our design documentation because we are struggling with our design documentation for, so far but plan is to to somehow track uh, the key design decisions also there because not every decision is imp is important for track I think, but some some are 